a tough day. This evening in Kabul, as you all know, terrorists attacked that we've been talking about and worried about, that the intelligence community has assessed, uh, has undertaken <clears throat> an attack by a group known as ISIS-K. <clears throat> Took the lives of American service members, standing guard at the airport, and wounded several others seriously. He had also wounded a number of civilians, and civilians were killed as well. I've been engaged all day in constant contact with the military commanders here in Washington and the Pentagon, as well as in Afghanistan and uh, Doha. And uh, my commanders here in Washington in the field have been on this with great detail, and you've had a chance to speak to some so far. The situation on the ground is still evolving, and I'm constantly being updated. <clears throat> These American service members who gave their lives, it's an overused word, but it's totally appropriate here, were heroes. Heroes who have been engaged in a dangerous, selfless mission to save the lives of others. They're a part of an airlift, an evacuation effort unlike any scene in history with more than 100,000 American citizens, American partners, Afghans who helped us, and others taken to safety in the last 11 days. Just in the last 12 hours or so, another 7,000 have gotten out. They were part of the bravest, most capable, the most selfless military on the face of the earth. And they're part of simply what I call the backbone of America. They're the spine of America, the best the country has to offer. Jill and I, our hearts ache, like I'm sure all of you do as well, for all those Afghan families who lost loved ones, including small children, or been wounded in this vicious attack. And we're outraged as well as heartbroken. <clears throat> Being the father of an Army major who served for a year in Iraq and before that was in Kosovo as a U.S. attorney for the better part of six months in the middle of a war. When he came home after a year in, a, in Iraq, he was diagnosed, like many, many coming home, with an aggressive and lethal cancer of the brain. We lost. We have some sense, like many of you do, what the families of these brave heroes are feeling today. You get this feeling like you're being sucked into a black hole in the middle of your chest. There's no way out. My heart aches for you. But I know this. We have a continuing obligation, <clears throat> a sacred obligation to all of you, the families of those heroes. That obligation is not temporary. It lasts forever. The lives we lost today were lives given in the service of liberty, the service of security, and the service of others, in the service of America, like their fellow brothers and sisters in arms who died defending our vision and our values in the struggle against terrorism. Of the fall on this day, they're part of a great and noble company of American heroes. To those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this, we will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. 
Over the past few weeks, <clears throat> I know you're many of you are probably tired of hearing me say it. We've been made aware by our intelligence community that the ISIS K, an arch enemy, the Taliban, people who were freed when both those prisons were opened, has been planning a complex set of attacks on the United States personnel and others. This is why, from the outset, I've repeatedly said this mission was extraordinarily dangerous, and on why I've been so determined to limit the duration of this mission. As General McKenzie said, this is why our mission was designed, this is the way it was designed to operate, operating under severe stress and attack. We've known that from the beginning. And as I've been in constant contact with our senior military leaders, and I mean constant, round the clock, and our commanders on the ground and throughout the day, they made it clear that we can and we must complete this mission, and we will. And that's what I've ordered them to do. We will not be deterred by terrorists. We will not let them stop our mission. We will continue the evacuation. I've also ordered my commanders to develop operational plans to strike ISIS-K assets, leadership, and facilities. We will respond with force and precision at our time, at the place we choose, in the moment of our choosing. Here's what you need to know. These ISIS terrorists will not win. We will rescue the Americans in there. We will get our Afghan allies out. And our mission will go on. America will not be intimidated. And I have the utmost confidence in our brave service members who continue to execute this mission with courage and honor to save lives and get Americans, our partners, our Afghan allies out of Afghanistan. Every day when I talk to our commanders, I ask them what they need. What more do they need, if anything, to get the job done? As they will tell you, I granted every request. I re reiterated them today on three occasions that they should take the maximum steps necessary to protect our forces on the ground in Kabul. And I also want to thank the Secretary of Defense and the military leadership of the Pentagon and all the commanders in the field. There has been complete unanimity from every commander on the objectives of this mission and the best way to achieve those objectives. Those who have served through the ages have drawn inspiration from the book of Isaiah, when the Lord says, Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? The American military has been answering for a long time. Here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, send me. Each one of these women and men of our armed forces are the heirs of that tradition of sacrifice, of volunteering to go in harm's way, to risk everything, not for glory, not for profit, but to defend what we love and the people we love. And I ask that you join me now in a moment of silence for all those in uniform and out, uniform, military and civilian, who have given the last full measure of devotion. Thank you. May God bless you all, and may God protect his troops and all those standing watch for America. We have so much to do. It's within our capacity to do it. We just have to remain steadfast. Steadfast. We will complete our mission, and we will continue after our troops have withdrawn, to find means by which we can find any American who wishes to get out of Afghanistan. We will find them, and we will get them out. Ladies and gentlemen, they gave me a list here. 
The first person I was instructed to call on was Kelly O'Donnell of NBC. <clears throat> you have said leaving Afghanistan is in the national interest of the United States. After today's attack, do you believe you will authorize additional forces to respond to that attack inside Afghanistan? And are you, are you prepared to add additional forces to protect those Americans who remain on the ground carrying out the evacuation operation? I've instructed the military, whatever they need, if they need additional force, I will grant it. But the military from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Joint Chiefs, the commanders in the field have all contacted me one way or another, usually by letter, saying they subscribe to the mission as designed to get as many people out as we can within the time frame that is allotted. That is the best way they believe to get as many Americans out as possible and others. And with regard to finding, tracking down the ISIS leaders who ordered this, we have some reason to believe we know who they are, not certain. And we will find ways of our choosing without large military operations to get them. Wherever they are. Um, Trevor Reuters. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, there's been some criticism, uh, even from people in your party, about the dependence on the Taliban to secure the perimeter of the airport. Do you, do you feel like there was uh, a mistake uh, made in that regard? No, I, I, I don't. Look, um, I think General McKenzie handled this question very well. The fact is that we're in a situation, we're inheriting a situation, particularly since, as we all know, that the Afghan military collapsed 11 days before in 11 days, that it is in the interest of, as McKenzie said, in the interest of the Taliban, that, in fact, ISIS-K does not metastasize beyond what it is, number one. And number two, it's in their interest that we are able to leave on time, on target. And as a consequence of that, the major things we've asked them, moving back the perimeter, giving more space between the wall, stopping vehicles from coming through, et cetera, searching people coming through. It is not what you'd call a tightly commanded, regimented, operation like the U.S. is, the military is, but they're acting in their interest, their interest. And so, by and large, and I've asked the same question to military on the ground, whether or not it's a useful exercise, no one trusts them. We're just counting on their self-interest to continue to generate their activities. And it's in their self-interest that we leave when we said, and that we get as many people out as we can. Like I said, even in the midst of everything that happened today, over 7,000 people we've gotten out, over 5,000 Americans over. So, uh, it's not a matter of trust. It's a matter of mutual self-interest. And uh, — but there is no evidence thus far that I've been given as a consequence by any of our commanders in the field that there has been collusion between the Taliban and ISIS in carrying out what happened today both in front of the hotel and what is expected to continue for uh, beyond today. Um, Amir, Associated Press. 
Thank you, Mr. President. You have spoken, um, again, powerfully about uh, your own son and the weight of these decisions. With that in mind, and also what you've said, um, that the longer we stay, the more likelihood that there would be a major attack. How do you weigh staying even one more day, considering what's happened? Because I think what America says matters. What we say we're going to do in the context in which we say we're going to do it, that we do it, unless something exceptional changes. There are additional American citizens. There are additional green card holders. There are additional personnel of our allies. There are additional SIV card holders. There are additional Afghans that have helped us. And there are additional groups of individuals that have been contacted us from women's groups to NGOs and others who have expressly indicated they want to get out and have gathered in certain circumstances in groups on buses and other means that still presents the opportunity for in the next several days between now and the 31st to be able to get them out. And our military, and I believe, to the extent that we can do that knowing the threat, knowing that we may very well have another attack, the military has concluded that's what we should do. I think they're right. I think they're correct. And after that, we're going to be in a uh, circumstance where there are, will be, I believe, numerous opportunities to continue to provide access for additional persons to get out of Afghanistan, either through means that we provide and or are provided through in cooperation with the Taliban. They're not good guys, the Taliban. I'm not suggesting that at all. But they have keen interest. As many of you have been reporting, they very much would like to figure out how to keep the airport open. They don't have the capacity to do it. They very much are trying to figure out whether or not they can uh, maintain what is a portion of an economy that has become not robust, but fundamentally different than it had been. And so there's a lot of reasons why they have reached out, not just to us, but to others, as to why it would be continued in their interest to get more of the personnel we want to get out, we can locate them. Now, there's not many left that we can assess that are, want to come out. There's some Americans we've identified, we've contacted the vast majority of them, if not all of them, who don't want to leave because they have they're dual nationals, they have extended families, et cetera. And there's others who uh, are looking for the time. So. That's why we continue. I'll take a few more questions, and uh, but you, sir. <laughs> I wanted to ask you. Uh, okay. You say that what America says matters. Um, what do you say to the Afghans who helped tr troops um, who may not be able to get out by August 31st? I what, say we're going to continue to try to get you out. It matters. Look. I know of no conflict, as a student of history, no conflict where, when a war was ending, one side was able to guarantee that everyone they wanted to be extracted from that country would get out. And think about it, folks. I think it's important for, I know the American people get this in their gut. There are I would argue millions of Afghani citizens 
who are not Taliban, who did not actively cooperate with us as SIVs, who, if given a chance, they'd be on board a plane tomorrow. It sounds ridiculous, but the vast majority of people in communities like that want to come to America, given a choice. So getting every single person out is — can't be guaranteed by anybody because there's a determination all who wants to get out as well. At any rate, it's a process. I was really pointing to you, but you, sir. Um, thank you, Mr. President. There are reports that — U.S. officials provided the Taliban with names of Americans and Afghan officials uh, to evacuate. Were you aware of that? Did that happen? And then, sir, did you personally reject a recommendation to hold or to recapture Bagram Air Force Base? Here's what I've done on the — let's ask this, answer the last question first. On the tactical questions of how to conduct an evacuation or a war, I gather up all the major military personnel that are in Afghanistan, the commanders, as well as the Pentagon. And I ask for their best military judgment. What would be the most efficient way to accomplish the mission? They concluded, the military, that Bagram was not much value added, that it was much wiser to focus on Kabul. And so I followed that recommendation. With regard to — there are certain circumstances where we've gotten information, and quite frankly, sometimes from some of you, saying you know of such and such a group of people are trying to get out, they're on a bus, they're moving from other people. And this is their location. And there have been occasions when our military has contacted their military counterparts in the Taliban and said, this — for example, this bus is coming through with X number of people on it, made up of the following group of people. We want you to let that bus or that group through. So, yes, there have been occasions like that. And to the best of my knowledge, in those cases, the bulk of that has occurred. They've been let through. But I can't tell you with any certitude that there's actually been a list of names. I know there may have been, but I know of no circumstance. It doesn't mean it's not — didn't exist. That here's the names of 12 people. They're coming. Let them through. That could very well have happened. I'll take one more question. Wait, 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 wait. Let me take the one question from the most interesting guy that I know in the press. That's you. Mr. President, there had not been a U.S. service member killed in combat in Afghanistan since February of 2020. You set a deadline, you pulled troops out, you sent troops back in, and now 12 Marines are dead. You said the buck stops with you. Do you bear any responsibility for the way that things have unfolded in the last two weeks? I bear responsibility for fundamentally all that's happened of late. But here's the deal. You know — I wish you'd one day say these things — you know, as well as I do, that a former president made a deal with the Taliban, that he would get all American forces out of Afghanistan by May 1. In return, the commitment was made — and that was a year before — in return, he was given a commitment that the Taliban would continue to attack others, but would not attack any American forces. Remember that? I'm, I'm being serious. I, no, I, I'm asking you a question. Be, uh, because before — no, 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 wait a minute. I'm asking you a question. Is that, is that accurate, the best — talking about, but, Mr. President, respectfully, since that I don't think that the issue that uh, — do you think that people have an issue with pulling out of Afghanistan or just the way that things have happened? I think — they have an issue that people are likely to get hurt. Some, as we've seen, have gotten killed, and that it is messy. The reason why, whether my friend will acknowledge it 
I always reported it. The reason why there were no attacks on Americans, as you said, from the date until I came into office, was because the commitment was made by President Trump, I will be out by May 1st. In the meantime, you agree not to attack any Americans. That was the deal. That's why no American was attacked. And you said that you still, uh, a few days ago, you said you squarely stand by your decision to pull out. Yes, I do, because look at it this way, folks. And I'm going to, I have another meeting for real. But imagine where we'd be if I had indicated on May the 1st, I was not going to renegotiate a, a evacuation date. We were going to stay there. I'd have only one alternative, pour thousands of more troops back into Afghanistan to fight a war that we had already won relative to why the reason we went in the first place. I have never been of the view that we should be sacrificing American lives to try to establish a democratic government in Afghanistan, a country that has never once in its entire history been a united country and is made up, and I don't mean this in a derogatory, made up of different tribes who have never, ever, ever gotten along with one another. And so, as I said before, and this is the last comment I'll make, we'll have more chance to talk about this, unfortunately, beyond, because we're not out yet. If Osama bin Laden, as well as Al Qaeda, had chosen to launch an attack when they left Saudi Arabia out of Yemen, would we have ever gone to Afghanistan? Even though the Taliban completely controlled Afghanistan at the time, would we have ever gone? I know it's not fair to ask you questions, it's rhetorical, but raise your hand if you think we should have gone and given up thousands of lives and tens of thousands of wounded. Our interest in going was to prevent Al Qaeda from reemerging, first to get bin Laden, wipe out Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, prevent that from happening again. As I've said a hundred times, terrorism is metastasized around the world. We have greater threats coming out of other countries, a heck of a lot closer to the United States. We don't have military encampments there. We don't keep people there. We have over the horizon capability to keep them from going after us. Ladies and gentlemen, it was time to end a 20-year war. Thank you so much. For a long time, the media were not permitted over at Dover during this war. And I think it was in 2009, I think it was, mm -hmm. um, there was such an uproar uh, over the, the lack of transparency. I mean, these are comrades of everybody, um, those who are serving and those who have served, um, that the, uh, the White House relented and uh, the media were permitted uh, to film this dignified ceremony that occurs unfortunately all too often. Uh, we thought we were finished with all this. And as the size of our force uh, gets smaller there in Kabul, it becomes increasingly difficult for our to, us to protect our uh, young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Um, and they are very young. Uh, they, uh, we, we seem to forget sometimes that we, it's, it's young people who defend us and a, and a very small number of young people who defend us and American interests around the globe. Um, we, we, uh, the large majority of people do not serve. Most people don't know anybody in uniform. And as a result, this comes as a tremendous shock, but no bigger shock than to those who serve together, who fought in a crucible of war, 
uh, saw their comrades fall. Uh, this brings it all home. The notion that we shouldn't see this uh, is a big mistake. We need to see this because we need to see the price that we pay for our freedom and the freedom of our friends and allies. Um, it's easy to get inured to see. If you saw this 2,000 times, maybe some people would become uh, impervious to this. But those who've been in uniform and those who have served with people who have fallen, for them, this will never become routine. Um, I think we need to show this every time it happens. I, I would agree with you because I think it shows uh, not only the way we handle this with dignity, but also just the solemnity and the challenges that America has around the world in trying to keep not only our interests, but those of others and our allies safe. There are constant risks around this planet. There, the window is closing basically on anybody who is still left in Kabul. Almost certainly we're gonna leave behind many, many Afghans who work for uh, the Americans over these last 20 years who won't be able to get out and will face uh, enormous risks. The question is, are there going to be Americans left behind? The president said he would not leave any Americans behind who want to get out. Uh, but these next 48 hours will be a challenge to, to live up to that promise. For a long while, the wars that we fought, we had an enormous number of casualties. Uh, many of our, our service members are buried overseas or they were missing forever, never to be for the remains, never to be found, but put into... Uh, into mass graves because there were so many of them, the war was going on, there was no opportunity for us to do the kind of, pay the kind of respect that we should. Um, in my war, the war in Vietnam, we had more than 58,000 uh, service members killed in action. Um, and uh, it, I don't want to say it turned out to be a logistical problem, but the, the the National Command Authority, starting with the President of the United States, did not want to put the kind of uh, magnifying lens on these losses uh, that would happen if you did something like this and broadcast it. Um, 58,000 is a very large number. There was one month, indeed there was one week, in which uh, the Life magazine, I think it was, uh, had on its front cover the faces, photographs of everybody killed that week. It covered up the entire cover of Life magazine with very small photographs. Um, we're, we're in a different place now. We don't have a draft. Like I mentioned earlier, most people don't even know anybody in uniform. It's important that we highlight the service and the sacrifice of the people who are, uh, who are keeping us free. And that's the reason for the kind of solemn ceremony you see now that took place before, even before the, the press were permitted to observe it in 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now that we can do it, it's important that, uh, it's very, very important that we see it. Uh, we. We forget all the time that, uh, that freedom isn't free. We, I'm reminded frequently of, uh, of an observation by uh, John Stuart Mill, and I'll paraphrase it. He said, um, a person who is uh, focused on his own safety is a miserable creature who is made free and kept free by better men than he. Uh, the people we see here uh, whose remains are being transferred, uh, they're the better men and women. They're the people who've decided to defend all of us. And like I said, it's important that we never forget these images and never forget what caused them. Yeah. Some of these 13 families, they may not be thrilled with the president right now. You know, directly or indirectly, the actions of this president are the reason these 
13 young people are coming home in 13 cases with American flags draped over them. And so I'm sure those conversations were tense. They were, of course, closed to the press. They were very private conversations. But I'm sure some of them had to be tense from, from media reports we're seeing as well. All of the Afghan allies who we will be leaving behind just as polling is now rolling in that shows that 71 percent of the American people don't want us to leave them behind, even though that is going to be a necessity based on uh, how this is, is being executed. A lot of these men and women who are coming back in caskets, they don't remember, they weren't around for the conversation that we had about why we went into Afghanistan in the first place. And yet it is their generation and, and a small segment, rightfully pointed out, of their generation that is paying the price for this, in this case, the ultimate price. Uh, I've been told by my executive producer that we believe there will be 11 of the 13 transferred on this particular C-17 plane. Uh, we will find out the details about the other two, where they are, when they will be arriving at Dover Air Force Base. Nobody should outlive his children. And so it's difficult to articulate what uh, what these poor people are going through. They sent their kids off, proud that they were in uniform, proud that they were defending the Republic. Uh, you, you don't expect the worst, and you always hope for the best. Uh, but the law of large numbers says that in a difficult situation, this sort of stuff is going to happen. And try to, trying to put oneself in the position of, uh, of parents uh, in this situation is absolutely impossible. There's no way we can articulate it, and there's no way that they'll ever be able to articulate it. I think it's one of the few things that time, uh, time doesn't change. It, it, matter of fact, maybe the grief becomes more acute over time for many people. And I got to say this, having been in units where I've lost friends and comrades uh, with whom I was close, it, f 55 years later, uh, their faces and their names pop up uh, mm. all the time. And the, old, the older you get, the more you think about them. Uh, these are kids. They will forever be kids in your mind. Uh, it's extremely difficult to articulate. If you haven't, if one hasn't been in the crucible of war, uh, it's impossible to articulate the, uh, the kind of emotion that waves over you at first loss, and then five plus decades later, when you think about them. For a president, any president, this is one of the worst days of their time in office. This kind of ceremony or this kind of transfer, this kind of event just brings home the cost, not just of war, but the cost of the decisions any president makes. And this is true, I think, from President George W. Bush at the beginning of this long war. It was true for President Obama and President Trump as well, that, that presiding or attending or observing this kind of event magnifies the consequences and the, and the reality of the decisions that you as a commander in chief make uh, every day. And I think that it, it, there's nothing harder on a president. And another thing I think to mention that is really important is just how young these men and women were. Uh, most of them were in their early 20s. The oldest was 31, the youngest 20 years old. And we've heard a couple of these stories of some of the folks that have gone out, some of the family members that have gone out to local media and told the stories of their loved ones. One of them being uh, Riley, uh, Riley McCollum, 20 years old of Jackson, Wyoming. He had just recently gotten married and he was three weeks away from becoming a father. Uh, and mm. so that's something notable as well. There was also uh, the, a, uh, what, what, Nicole LG, 23 years old of Sacramento, California. She just days ago posted on Instagram a photo of her carrying a young child in Afghanistan saying how much she loved her job. Uh, so these are people that were saving lives out there in Afghanistan, both American and Afghani lives.